chapter 3. We're going to hit the whole uh, chapter tonight. And what I want to do is I want to break it up into little chunks and then come back and just kind of walk through it. And at the end, make some big, bigger like application points uh, for us. Uh, but before we do that, I want to tell you um, about a, a house it was in, built in Dallas, Texas. It started to be built in 1995. It took eight years to build. Um, it's built in a very wealthy part of Dallas, uh, the same neighborhood um, uh, Ross Perot's house is in, uh, Dirk Nowitzki, if you're a basketball fan, um, the man that invented hefty trash bags, uh, that, that same neighborhood. So it's, it's called the Row of Billionaires, very expensive house. Uh, took, as, it's, as I said, it took eight years to build, $70 million, and again, you're talking in 1995 uh, to 2003, I guess. So, you know, I don't know what that would be in today's money, but $70 million is a ton of money no matter what here it is but that's it's quite a bit more now obviously uh 70,000 square feet the master bedroom is 1800 square feet so the master bedroom is bigger than my house um it's got a 16 car garage so automatic car wash is a part of that garage uh, the basement is the basement alone is 17,000 square feet it's got a lap pool and it's got a volleyball pool because obviously you can't do both of those things in the same pool. So you need a lap pool and a volleyball pool. Uh, it's got a wine cellar. with It's a 20,000 bottle capacity wine cellar. So I figured that out today. Uh, that would be a, if you drank a bottle a day, you'd be set for 55 years. So you'd be good there. Uh, it's got a 21 seat movie theater. Uh, it's got not four pool tables, four pool table rooms. So four rooms where you can go play pool. Uh, and then it's got, if this doesn't show you, if you just got everything you would ever need, it's got a room specifically dedicated uh, to gift wrapping. So, um, you know, can't do that in the kitchen or the living room or whatever. So we got a gift wrapping room. Now, uh, two weeks before this was, uh, before the person was going to move in, and again, working on this for eight years. Two weeks before the person was to move in, they were upstairs um, putting lacquer or whatever it is, the, the top coat of, of the, the slick stuff on floors, whatever that's called. Um, and, you know, you're, you're in the Texas heat. This is obviously a massive upstairs room with big windows that are facing the sun. And the, just the heat of the sun magnified through those windows, caught those fumes on fire and the, before they could do anything about it, the entire house was a loss. So no one ever lived in that house. It was the biggest, um, it was one of the most expensive houses built at the time. But it was for, at the time, it was the biggest residential insurance claim um, ever in, in, in America. But no one ever lived in that house. So I want you to, to think about that. Hold on to that story. And as we get to the end and make our applications here, um, we're, we're going to come back to that. But... Let's go through Acts chapter 3. Uh, we're going to go verses 1 through 10 to begin with. And then, as I said, we'll come back and make some comments and work our way through the chapter. So, Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. That's the ninth hour. Uh, and so, just remember, the uh, uh, Jewish day started at 6 a.m. That was, we started at midnight, theirs was 6 a.m. So, the ninth hour is 3 in the afternoon. Uh, so they, it's the ninth hour. A man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go in the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So uh, first thing I would just say is, is this, this is... When we come to Acts chapter 3, this is usually the text that gets preached or taught, that the healing of this man. 
the reality of the third chapter of Acts is the healing is really just pointing to everything else. And, and there's a few verses here that kind of foreshadow or, or shed some light on what's going to go on later in the um, chapter or what the real importance is of this text uh, for Luke in, in his telling of this. So right there in the very first chapter is one, or the very first verse is one of those things. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. As, as, as uh, you know, 21st century uh, American, this doesn't uh, maybe land with us. We just take that as a factual statement, and it is a factual statement, that they were going up for the hour of prayer. Now, what Luke's readers and um, the Jewish people there would have understood is that what they've just missed, what Peter and John have just missed, is the hour of sacrifice. So they're not going up to the temple for sacrifice. And they, they, the reason is obvious to Christians, um, but it may not have been as obvious to the people there. They're holding to the tradition of prayer, but they're not going to the, the, to the hour of sacrifice. Well, the reason was there's no more need for a sacrifice because of what Jesus had done. And so right here in the very first verse, you know, as, as again, as, as a 21st century reader, we miss it, but Luke's audience would, audience would have understood, okay, well, they apparently, for some reason, don't aren't holding to the hour of sacrifice is important. They're skipping that and just going to the temple for prayer. So maybe even if they didn't know why they weren't doing it, they would have at least caught on to that. Okay, something's going on here. Um, and we'll see in the rest of the text here. Uh, verse two, uh, as we mentioned, or as we didn't mention, um, uh, but as, as Luke says here, he talks about the beautiful gate. And I've got a picture here uh, of the temple mount. So just want everyone to kind of have a visualization so this is a model of the Temple Mount. Um, and it's really, it's cool. That's actually a model of the entire city of Jerusalem that they've built. It's probably, uh, I don't how, who, did you guys go to that? Or is that, okay. How big do you think that was? Is it as big as this room? Yeah. Bigger? Okay, so it's, they've taken, carved out little stones and, and made a temple, or a model of not just the temple, but the city of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, and it's, it's massive. Steve thinks it's bigger than this room, and it very well may be. I mean, it is massive. So that's actually what this is from, and that's the Temple Mount there. So when we're talking about the Temple Mount, the temple was built on a hill, not really a mountain, the, uh, the hill that they flattened. Um, so none of that is there. Uh, about what's there is... I guess I'm going to have to get off the camera, maybe. Um, this stuff and the gates, but all this upper wall, the portico, this is the actual temple. All that stuff is gone, uh, destroyed in, in A.D. 70. Um, but that's what the temple would have looked like in Jesus' day. So when we talk about the temple, we're actually talking about the building in the middle there. That's the whole thing is the Temple Mount. And this is called Herod's Temple uh, because in 586, the Babylonians destroyed Solomon's Temple. And so Herod the Great rebuilt the temple. He's responsible for uh, quite a bit of the architecture that's over there now, uh, Herod the Great. So Herod the Great is the father of the Herod that we're familiar with, Herod Antipas, who's the Herod that um, was living when Jesus was alive, that, that uh, had the little babies killed, that wanted the wise men to report where they found Jesus. It was his dad who had this temple built. And so that's the temple. Um, let's go to the next slide. Let's get uh, a little bit more detail here. So the beautiful gate. On this um, uh, picture, you can see that it's labeled here. Can we go back to the other picture? Sorry, real quick. So according to that slide we just showed, this gate would be the beautiful gate. Um, there's, we don't know what gate the beautiful gate is. But go back to the other one then, Steve. Uh, so uh, there's two, well, there's actually three um, suggestions. One of them is it's the gate that was in the wall, um, but no one really takes that seriously. So the two suggestions are this one, which is the gate into the temple, or this one. Uh, and many people think it's actually this one, the gate of Nicanor, because Josephus, uh, a Jewish historian, um, describes, who lived during the time of Jesus, describes this gate as the most beautiful gate, bigger than all the other gates. So many people think it's that. Now, Here's why that would be a little bit important. I mean, it doesn't really matter which gate it is. But as you can see, um, that's in between what's labeled the gate beautiful and the gate of Nicanor is the woman's courtyard. And so women, Jewish women, were not allowed to go past that. Okay? 
outside of the temple, you can see down here, it's called the Gentiles' courtyard. So Gentiles couldn't even go into the temple. Women could go into the temple ground, but couldn't go past that courtyard there. Now, if the beautiful gate is the inside gate, the interior gate that Josephus describes, the gate of Nicanor, the other people that also could not have gone past that would have been lame people. So potentially this man is um, at this gate, uh, the inside gate, the gate of Nicanor, but he's never been able to go inside that uh, into the um, inner part of the temple because he's lame, which if that's the case, it makes this story... um, if it's that inside gate, it, it does add a little something uh, to this um, text as we get down into it just a little bit more. So we've got the beautiful gate. Just wanted you to see that. But also flip over to Acts chapter 4, verse 22. Uh, so what happens in Acts chapter 4, if you don't know, is Peter and John get in trouble for um, healing this man and then preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel more than healing the man. Uh, and they get dragged in front of the... Um, Jewish leaders, but Acts chapter 4, verse 22, speaking of this man they just healed, says this, for the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So we know from Acts chapter 4 that he's 40 years old, and we know from Acts chapter 3 that he's been lame since birth. We also know that he's been laid there daily. So if he's 40 years old and he's laid there daily and he's been that way since birth, Who's probably walked by this guy? I mean, a lot of people, but who? Did someone say it? The priest have? A specific person. Jesus. Jesus has probably walked by this guy a number of times and never healed him. Okay? So one of the things uh, that we see here is uh, that God's timing is as important as his will. Or maybe a better way to say that is that God's will is his timing and what he wants. That those two things are not separated. That God's will is what he wants and when he wants it. Um, And so sometimes uh, when we're we're hoping for something to happen or praying for something to happen and it's taking a long time, it could just be that God is waiting to do it uh, for his greater glory at a a different time. And I think as we'll see... um, The glory here is probably a greater thing. God is more glorified in what Peter and John do than if Jesus had healed this man. Because we know that Jesus healed a bunch of people and, um, you know, it did... It did result in some converts, but oftentimes it resulted in people just outright rejecting him. Uh, And we'll see that uh, perhaps, you know, what Jesus says about um, greater things than these will you do, um, that maybe... This is what he was talking about. This is an instance of that. Um, so uh, God's will, it's, it's, it's about timing and what he wants, not just what he wants. So uh, let's go to verse 5. It says he, um, he fixed his attention on them and was expecting to receive something from them. So again, I want you to hang on to that verse that this man, as he's asked for something for Peter and John, he has the expectation that he's going to get something from them. And obviously the expectation is that he's going to get money from them. He's going to get alms from them. It's a, it's a financial reward that he has the expectation to get. But hang on to that verse as we get into um, Peter's response uh, to the crowd here in just a minute. Because that's going to help us understand uh, what's going on. And then in verse 8, after the healing, it says he, leaped, or he leapt up. He was leaping up. He stood and began to walk and entered the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And so, regardless really of where the beautiful gate is, the fact of the matter is, he was now able to go into the temple, to go in with Peter and John because of this healing. So now, because of what, uh, what Peter's going to say, that Jesus has done, that he is now able to go into a place um, that he's never done. And so, again, verse 8 is kind of foreshadowing what's coming is that what's happening here is not a physical thing but only, but what's happening here is primarily a spiritual thing. And that because of Jesus, now people are connected with God. It's very similar to what we talked about the day of Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit has been poured out on all people, and that because we're in the age of the Spirit, that now all people have the ability, or the, the possibility of being in constant communion and connection with God through the Holy Spirit. And so, again... Luke is showing us how this works um, in reality. 
So let's go on, verses 11 through 16. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So after this man jumps up and celebrates and is clearly drawing attention, Peter and John leave the temple. And the reason they leave the temple is because there's greater... If you want to go back to the other slide, um, you can see... The columns there on the outside of the temple, that's, that's Solomon's colonnade. So this is a gathering place, for, and, and Gentiles would be there, obviously, Jewish people. The most people are going to be gathering here. And so Peter and John take this opportunity and say, well, let's not just preach this message in the temple. Let's go out where the most people are going to have the maximum effect uh, for preaching the gospel. And, and, and we're going to say in a minute, everything in the book of Acts is in light of what Jesus Uh, told the apostles in the church in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, to be my witnesses. So Peter and John are grabbing hold of this opportunity to be the most effective and powerful witnesses they can by leaving the temple and going out into Solomon's portico where there's going to be more hearers, more listeners. Um, So that's what they do. Then verse 12, uh, he asks, why does this surprise you? Um, Why do you wonder at this? Why are you surprised at this? Or why do you stare at us? Now, Let's be honest. If any of us saw this at, at that point of time or any other time, if we saw healing now, tonight, someone came up and grabbed someone that was f- clearly physically hurting, and we saw an instant healing, we would be both amazed at what we just saw, and we'd be staring at the person like, what? <laughs> I didn't know you could do this. Why? I mean, this is impressive. We would definitely have some thoughts about that person that we probably had not had before, and they would be thoughts of amazement. They would be positive thoughts, obviously. So it's kind of weird that Peter says, why, why are you amazed at this? Why are you staring at us? But here's Peter's point, the following verses there. Um, Men of Israel, why do you do this? Verse 13, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers. So basically what he's saying is, your God, right? He's, he's making it clear here. Your God glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murder to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life. Here's the part that would say, why would you be surprised at this? Whom God raised from the dead. So Peter's point is, you've already seen this. And remember, these are Jewish people living in Jerusalem, so they've their witnesses to this resurrection as well. And even if they didn't actually see Jesus, they've heard this. They know this. And so Peter's point is, if you really believe in the resurrection, why would you be surprised at a healing? If you really believe that this man can lay down his life and take up his life again, then what, what would surprise you about a man that can't walk, can walk all of a sudden, about fixing an ankle? You know, so that's Peter's point there. It's not that we ought not to be interested or surprised or in awe of that kind of thing, but it's if you really believe in the resurrection, then of course this can happen. If this is nothing, if, you, if a man can lay his life down and take it up again on his own power, then of course he can heal feet. So don't be surprised at that. Um, so Peter gives these three titles. He's already addressed them as your God, but he gives three titles for Jesus. It's his servant, uh, Yahweh's servant, the holy and righteous one, and the author of life. And the reason he chooses these three is because he's addressing Jewish people. And all three of these titles are important Old Testament titles. So we've got the servant, um, Yahweh's servant, spoken of in Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, by his stripes we are healed. So there's this, this servant that's going to come, God's servant who's going to come, also in the Old Testament, Oftentimes, the entire nation of Israel is referred to as Yahweh's servant, but God also um, uh, embodies the entire 
nation of Israel in one person, speaking of that person as God's servant. So Moses, Abraham, David are all spoken of as Yahweh's servant as a representation of Israel, but also pointing forward to another one who's going to come. So Jewish people, when they hear this phrase, Yahweh's servant, they're thinking of Messiah. They've got that in their mind. So Peter's making a clear connection here. This is Yahweh's servant. This is Messiah who, you, who you've been waiting for. He also calls him holy and righteous. Well, these are words that don't just get thrown around for anyone amongst God's people. Holy and righteous, that is Yahweh. It's describing God's nature. And so Peter, in saying this, is saying Jesus is in very nature God. He's Messiah, and he's also the same as God. He is, in, he is one with God. He is in very nature God. And then he refers to him as the author of life, which, again, the connection to Yahweh being creator. There's Jesus uh, connect with that same um, uh, authority, that same um, honor as being the creator of life. The word author is, is a word that's it's a little bit not maybe... This, this, this Greek word is a word that we don't have a great word for. Um, so author is it, uh, but it's, it carries really more is the idea of originator, um, but not just the originator, but also the one who's in control, okay? So what Peter is saying to them is, you just killed the person who created life, but is also in control of all life. He's the originator of life. So what he's done is he's put these Old Testament names to Jesus because he's talking to Jewish people. So here's the lesson for us, I think, in, in evangelizing um, is uh, know your audience. And, and we looked at this a little bit Wednesday and in the book of Acts later, Paul, when he's speaking to Jewish people, says one thing. When he's speaking to Greek or Gentile people, says another thing. He uses different tactics. So you have to kind of know your audience and, and know where you can connect with someone uh, when you're talking about Jesus. Um, but then that's exactly what Peter does. He connects with them right with what they understand. So verse 16, after he's called him those three names, Yahweh's servant, uh, the holy and righteous one, and um, the author of life, verse 16, he says, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man uh, this perfect health in the presence of you all. So when he says his name, he's, he doesn't mean by speaking his name. All of us know that if you simply speak the name of Jesus, there's no power in just saying Jesus, okay? It's what, what Peter is saying is that the name of Jesus stands for the reality of who Jesus is. And that's what healed him. The reality of who Jesus is is, is what has healed this man. So he's, he's, he's picking all of the honor to Jesus and taking all of the honor off of him. It's Jesus who has healed this man. And then the very next thing he says, it's there um, in um, sort of inserted in the... In the uh, whatever the hyphen's there. It says, uh, by faith in his name. So he's healed by his name, but then he says, by faith in his name. And this is why I wanted you to hang on to the verse from the first text, or the first portion that we read, where it says, he was expecting something from them. We, generally speaking, when someone gets healed in Scripture, we think of it as a result of the faith of the person who was healed. Right? That's mostly what we see in the Gospels. That Jesus heals people and praises them because of their faith. And so he either grants them eternal life or forgiveness of sins or um, uh, physical healing because of their faith. Nowhere in this text do we see that, that this man that was healed has expressed faith at all. The only real faith that he's shown is he's trusting in God's people, the Jewish people, when they come to the temple to give him alms. And in fact... That verse that we just read, his expectation for, from Peter and John was that he would give them something, or they would give him something, but it would be monetary. It would be, it would be money. So um, to say, I think that it was his faith that brought about this healing is incorrect. It's actually the faith of Peter and John that brought about this healing. It's their faith in the name of Jesus. I'm not even sure this man has a, a grasp of who Jesus is. Uh, and so it was Peter and John's faith in who Jesus was that brought, to, uh, brought healing. Um, but now, what do we just say? It has nothing to do with Peter and John. 
It was Jesus' name, not Peter and John. So what is the very next thing Peter says? Has made this man strong. So faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know. And now look at this. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So yes, it was Peter and John's faith that healed this man, but who'd the faith come from? Jesus. So even to have faith is grace. And so here Peter and John are just uh, putting all the responsibility or the um, honor or the, the uh, uh, what's the word when you do something? The credit, uh, all the credit to Jesus for this healing. So everything's pointing to Jesus. Let's finish up with the last part here, beginning in verse 17. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that is, Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. The times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Uh, so we're going to mostly hang out in the front part of that part of the text, but uh, I did want to mention one thing, the bringing up of the name Samuel. Again, that's to point to Jesus coming from David. He could have talked about a lot of prophets, but he chooses Samuel. Why? Because Samuel is the one that anoints David. And so Peter is making a connection here again to the kingship of David and that Jesus comes from that line and that he is, in fact, the, the, the one who has full authority over Israel, that he is Israel's king, uh, and that through him all the nations will be blessed. So, um, th this is the sermon there, very similar to the sermon that we just looked at a couple weeks ago, or last week, whenever that was, uh, in um, Acts chapter 2. So, let's look at a few of the similarities. I got a slide there. Uh, first of all, both of them are addressed to the men of Israel. That's an obvious thing because he was talking to Jewish people, but the title, Men of Israel, it, he is doing that on purpose. He is getting their attention by pointing them to the fact that they are the people of God. And here's what your scriptures have said, and I'm going to lay it all out there for you. So both, both sermons begin with that, that the men of Israel. In both sermons, Jesus is presented as Messiah. In both sermons, the Jewish people are responsible for Jesus' death. In both sermons, Jesus is raised up by God. Uh, both sermons, there's an offer for repentance. In both sermons, that offer of repentance leads to the forgiveness of sins. And in both these sermons, he uses Old Testament prophecy uh, to point to Jesus as a fulfillment of great Old Testament leaders. So David, Moses, Abraham. Again, so these are very similar things, uh, which is important for one of the um, things I, w I do want to draw your attention to. Uh, verse 19 after he preaches, he says this, Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. And so that's the closest connection that we have uh, in these two sermons to Acts chapter 238, which says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we talked about, in Acts chapter 2, the word ice. In English, it would be E-I-S. Uh, in Acts chapter 2... Uh, the word we translate, or it's translated here in the ESV, for, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, ice, for the forgiveness of sins. And we, we mentioned that almost always in the New Testament, ice means for, meaning unto or into, but it does occasionally mean because. And so, um, uh, those who would say that baptism is, is uh, simply an act of obedience and an outward uh, profession of your faith and nothing more, um, they tend to translate that verse because. 
But jump over to Acts chapter 3, where Peter essentially is saying the same thing. Repent, therefore, and turn back that. That's the word ice. Into, unto. It's clear here. That word is not because. Repent, therefore, and turn back. Because your sins are blotted out makes no sense. And so what you have to do, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to defend anything. I'm just trying to bring out the text and let you make your own decisions. But what you have to do if you want to say Acts chapter 2 says because is you have to say that Peter essentially says two different things in sermons back to back. And that one says repent because your sins are forgiven and one says repent for the forgiveness of your sins. Um, so I'm just, I'm just, that's just there for you to take because it's in the text uh, and do, do with it um, what, whatever you will. Um, but, and by the way, who, the, 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 the ones that argue for because in chapter two, I don't know any of them that argue for because in chapter three. So um, that's, just, that's just there for you. And again, do with it what you want. Um, but more importantly, verse 20, uh, we're talking about repentance. And then Peter says that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time of, for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. So here Peter kind of changes, and he's almost talking end times, eschatologically, um, talking end time stuff, talking about the second coming of Jesus, the coming of Jesus. Um, and so um, he, here he's not talking about conversion, Verse 19, he was talking about conversion, but here he's not talking about conversion. Uh, and so um, what, what, it, what it seems to me to say is that conversion leads to the second coming of Christ. And I'll go back to Matthew chapter 24. So I, th I think it's similar kind of what we talked about in prayer that God has ordained, we looked at in Revelation chapter 5 and chapter 8, that God has ordained that his people pray, and when those bowls or those censers get filled up, he pours those prayers out upon the earth, and that, that, you know, that what he's going to do at the end begins uh, once those bowls are poured out um, there upon the earth, as if to say, God is waiting for us to fill those up with our prayers, that our prayers really do matter. Um, and I, I think Luke, or Peter is saying the same thing here in this sermon, uh, that, that converting people matters. But here's uh, an even more clear indication of that, I believe. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. This is Jesus. And this gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom, will be pro proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. So if you're, if you're looking forward to Jesus' return, we need to get on converting people because that's going to sort of inaugurate this. Um, and I, maybe some of us aren't looking forward to Jesus' return because we read stuff and, and it's scary. Um, it's not scary for Christians, okay? And the more people we convert, it won't be scary for them. So we just need to get on this converting is what uh, I think Peter is. Well, he's not actually saying that, but that's what I'm taking from what Peter is saying. Um, that uh, salvation is not just about salvation, but it's actually about what Jesus is going to do as well. So I want to end there with the text and then just think about um, some big ideas. And as I said, uh, everything that we read in the book of Acts after chapter 1 needs to be read in the light of Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Because this is the mission that Jesus has given the apostles, but also the church. And I'll, I'll try not to keep repeating this, but I'll, I'll repeat it a little bit early on in this lesson series just to make sure that everyone's heard it. Uh, Acts chapter 8, but you will receive power and the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And again, I know I've beat this horse, but I want everyone to hear it, that Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth is exactly the way that the book of Acts plays out, um, and it's uh, the ends of the earth have not been reached yet, so clearly this is a mission that is beyond the apostles, but even more than that, uh, we see in the book of Acts that as 
the gospel leaves Jerusalem, where the apostles are primarily the ones doing the preaching and teaching. Acts chapter 8, because of persecution, the gospel or the church has to leave Jerusalem and the gospel leaves and goes into the regions of Judea and Samaria primarily because the church takes it. The apostles go too, but you know, you can go right over to Acts chapter 1 or 8, verses 1 and 4. Um, There arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Then verse 4, now those who were scattered, which would be the church, except the apostles, went about preaching the word. And so Jesus, this this is us. This is our mission. And um, the, the point of me repeating that is not to make anyone feel bad. It's just to say this is the mission. And um, we need to complete the mission. We need to be obedient to Jesus' mission. And even if you don't take Acts chapter 1, you got the Great Commission. To go into all the world, to make disciples, baptizing people, and teaching them to obey all the things that I've commanded you. Um, and so that's, that's the disciples' call, is to make more disciples. So everything that we read in Acts is in light of Acts chapter 1. So our mission so here's some big takeaways that are a couple big takeaways that I would say. One is our faith in this matters. And that seems like a, probably an obvious statement. Um, but what I see in Peter and John is those are people that believe in the resurrection. And not just believe that it happened, obviously. They believed in it happened because they saw it. These are two men that believe in the resurrection that it happened, but they believe in the power of the resurrection. They believe in the effect of their resurrection. They don't just believe it's a historical event, that they believe that it matters in the here and now and everything that Jesus is doing in the kingdom. And we saw that, that it was their faith that healed this man. So it was their faith that led to this event that then led them to have the ability or the opportunity uh, to preach the gospel. And so uh, a question for us uh, that I think is important as we take seriously our uh, mission to be as witnesses is not just do I believe that the, uh, the God, that the resurrection happened, but do I really believe that that power of life over death is in me through the Holy Spirit, who Jesus has sent me, has given me his helper? Do I really believe that power is in me? Not that our duty is to go around healing people, because uh, I think the scripture is clear that not everyone has the gift of healing. That's not the point. But the power of the resurrection is real and it's in all of us through the Holy Spirit. Uh, and if I, if I believe that and have faith in that, and then that's what faith would be, then moving in action, um, then my witness will probably be more effective. My, my ability to carry out the mission to be his witness will be more effective. The other thing that I would say, Wednesday or Sunday night, excuse me, uh, if you don't know, Sunday night we started... Um, uh, going through a book called Conversational Evangelism. If you weren't there, we'd love to have you there. Uh, give you a little plug here. Um, we're going we're gonna to go through one chapter a month throughout this school year. And one of the things I told the people we talked about was evangelism. That word makes most of us nervous or uncomfortable because we just, just to do it or we feel unqualified or not worthy to do it, whatever reason. For a lot of us, that makes us uncomfortable Uh, conversational evangelism is not about knocking on doors or walking up to strangers or street preaching. It's none of that. It's about how to just have good gospel conversations with the people around you. And we're going to learn some practical skills. So we don't need to be afraid of evangelism. Um, And hopefully that, uh, going through that book, will help us um, with those things. We had a good discussion. Jenny brought up, what about um, evangelism and word kind of compared to or versus our, our witness or our evangelism through deed. So word versus work. Um, and I don't, the thing I said that night was, uh, we talked, we had a long discussion. Both those things are important. The thing that I fear for the church is that we go to the evangelism through work and cop out on the evangelism through the word. And just say, well, I evangelize through acts of service, so I don't have to do this. And that's just not biblical. That's just, that's, there's nowhere, we can't find that anywhere in scripture. So uh, we have to do both. Um, But I think this is the picture of that. 
This is the picture of both of those things colliding, uh, of the work and the word um, in union. And think about this. Uh, None of us have probably ever healed anyone, I'm guessing. Maybe we have. But probably a lot of us have given money to someone that was begging, right? And that's a work. That's that's an opportunity, and that's good. Uh, But if you just give the money and you walk away, I'm not saying don't do that, but we haven't really done much in that person's life in regard to showing them Jesus because we've simply just given them something and walked away. And let's just be honest. Um, I mean, how many times have you seen or it's happened to you where you helped, gave someone money, and they said, God bless you. And then you were like, yeah, and you walked off or whatever. They spoke more about God than we did, right? And, then, and honestly, that's a, when we talk about conversational evangelism, if someone ever says, God bless you, there's your in, right? Oh, they're going to say that? Now we can talk about God. There's your opportunity. But sometimes that's what we do. We, we talk less about God than sometimes even the person that we're helping. And obviously that Again, puts the glory on us and not God. So we can't divide these two things. But Peter and John, they did something that was clearly supernatural. They didn't give the guy money. They healed the man. And yet Peter and John used that as an opportunity to to preach the gospel. And in fact, the healing, the whole purpose of that, I believe, um, from God was to open a door to say, Yeah, this guy, Jesus, he can heal people physically. And he did that to point to the fact that Messiah, Jesus, can heal people spiritually. That's the whole point of Acts chapter 3. It's not the physical healing. It's the spiritual healing. um, That that the work leads to the word. um, And that, that the whole thing of the physical was to lead us to the spiritual. And so, as we wrap up um, and think about this in, uh, in terms of our calling to be witnesses, um, I, would, I would say this. We have been equipped with every good thing necessary to do the thing that God has called us to do. And first and foremost, obviously, the Holy Spirit. So I want to go back to that house in Texas that was decked out to the best it could have possibly been decked out. And I don't know how you guys felt when I read those things about that house. I'm, actually, I'm kind of turned off by it. Like, I don't, I don't care about any of that stuff. But you get the point. Like, that, that, that house was built um, to the best it could possibly be built with all the extravagances and, you know, everything that a person could need or want. But it was never used. Not one person ever lived in that house. And so its purpose was totally destroyed or, you know, it was never met its purpose because it was destroyed and unused and that's the reality for us it's for it's 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 infinitely greater because you look at the the, sort of the stats of that house compared to being decked out with the holy spirit and they're not comparable and we are filled with the holy spirit enabled and empowered by the holy spirit and so if we just simply lean on work or only word if we're only one of those two things um, then in the same way, we're not meeting our purpose. And we're, it's, 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 a more, it's, a, it's a more sad story, obviously, than the house being destroyed if we're not meeting our purpose uh, in Christ. And so we want to be people of the word and people of work. And those two things, for an effective witness, have to come together. So let's pray, and then we'll have a discussion. God, thank you again for uh, your word. And, and I pray again that you would move in Parkview Christian Church Uh, to make us people who speak truth and who live out truth. Uh, We want both of those things to meet in all of our lives. We want want people to see us as the light of the world. We want people to see our good works and to give glory to you. But we also know, God, um, that if they only see our good works, they can't give glory to you unless we tell them about you. So, God, use uh, use our works in the same way that you did Peter and John's as a witness to the message that they would speak. Um, Use our service and our acts of love and compassion and mercy to testify to the true things that we speak about you, God. Embolden us, empower us, encourage us. Uh, Thank you for equipping us with your spirit. Make us useful in your kingdom. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.